If we want to avoid ticks completely, where can we move to where we would not be affected by that and at the same time would have the, be the last people to be affected by climate change? Well, there are few um, states in the union that are completely tick free, um, but there are certainly places in the middle of the desert <laughs> you're not going to find a lot of ticks. Um, ticks need a certain amount of moisture and cover um, of foliage uh, in order to survive. There has to be um, an ecosystem that they um, can uh, that their lives can be supported by. Uh, they need small mammals and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think somewhere that's very dry, um, these deserts that are increasingly um, forming <laughs> may be one solution to the tick crisis, um, but it, certainly that's no solution at all. Um, Dar, you had previously mentioned the word feedback loops and talked about methane being released. Do you want to expand on that and just tell us what a feedback loop is and why that concerns you? Uh, feedback loop, uh, the, I would imagine most folks in this audience are aware, but the most commonly used example is the Arctic summer sea ice. It acts like a giant mirror reflecting most of the sun's radiation back into space, but as the, the atmosphere warms and the seawater warms, the ice shrinks, so leaving more dark ocean exposed, which absorbs more sunlight, which warms it faster, which shrinks more ice, which warms it faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So an, one scientist, Dan Fagri at USGS, scientist at Glacier National Park, had the greatest definition of a feedback loop, it, which is the more something happens, the more something happens. Um, cuts to the chase, really. Um, there's dozens of them that are already kicked in, uh, one of them being the thawing terrestrial permafrost, which is then uh, releasing more CO2 and lesser methane into the atmosphere, which warms it, which thaws the permafrost, which releases more, et cetera, and then the subsea methane. So I had a whole chapter um, on, on permafrost and subsea permafrost in the book, and disconcertingly, uh, I interviewed a scientist who's done work for NASA before and uses NASA satellites to track methane. And he, he, focused, he was at the time focusing specifically over the Arctic Ocean. And he published actually a peer, he, he co-authored a peer-reviewed study. It was published in either 2011 or 2012. So uh, quite, quite a few years ago. And, and the shocking bit of this study was that, um, you know, we talk about methane releases to come, again, future tense up in the Arctic regions, and a normal background rate of seeps in a thousand square kilometer in the area of the Barents Sea where he was monitoring was, I think it was two to 3,000 uh, natural methane, small methane seeps over a thousand square kilometer area. And his study that was published in 2011 or 12 found 60 million seeps in a thousand square kilometer already in an area of the Barents because that's an area where warming waters from the Atlantic Ocean are coming up into the Arctic area and then, and then migrating around and that's one of the first areas that's hitting and warming and he, he's concerned and expects that trend to consider all around the shallow seas of the Arctic and so that's the big danger of, of the loss of the sea ice and why so many people are so freaked out Scientists I've known that were always against geoengineering are now even proponents of it, saying, look, no matter what happens, we have to find a way to keep the Arctic sea ice there because we cannot let more ocean be exposed. We cannot risk the subsea methane. We know how much is trapped down in there from being released. So that's, that's a huge, huge concern up there on top of the terrestrial permafrost, which, as I mentioned earlier, is now melting 70 years ahead of the previous worst case estimates. So you mentioned the word geoengineering. Um, up until now, I've always considered that um, a concerning thought, that word. Um, what is your, your opinion on it? I'm 100% opposed to it. Uh, I think it's insane. I think, you know, we have geoengineered the planet by, by adding so much CO2 to the atmosphere. And um, so I don't think geoengineering is the solution to get ourselves out of this crisis uh, on top of just the arrogance that goes with thinking um, 
this system that we know so little about, let's put it that way. I mean, I, I spoke this morning about being in the Amazon with Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, the godfather of biodiversity, studying the Amazon since 1965 and uh, talking about how literally even today they're still discovering an average of 1.5 new species a day in the Amazon. And I asked this guy, who'd been studying the Amazon longer than I've been alive, I said, wow, we must know a whole lot about the Amazon, right? And he says, we don't know anything. You know, we've barely scratched the surface. And that's just the Amazon, not even talking about the entire planet, let alone the oceans, which we, we've mapped more of the moon than we've mapped more of the deep sea oceans. And we're gonna go geoengineer this one planet, knowing so little about it is, seems like utter complete insanity to me, let alone the arrogant. Could you just define what geoengineering in this text means? Well, geoengineering in the Arctic, they've talked, you know, one idea is, uh, well, let's go ahead and spread massive amounts of tiny white plastic pieces that mimic snow across the permafrost right up to the coast to try to start. You know, we, we don't, what are the implications of that? You know, what does that do to the animal life there? Um, seeding clouds, um, s releasing sulfur higher up in the atmosphere to reflect more sunlight back. And the problem with these techniques are you might have an immediate response. It might, on the, in the very, very short term, um, drop the temperature down a little bit or stop it temporarily from increasing further. But then that would be used, one concern is that would be used by the powers that be to just keep on with business as usual. And no, we don't need to make the dramatic effects. We'll just geoengineer some more. And of course, all the geoengineering is also itself extremely fossil fuel intensive. So however way you play that hand, it just does not end well. It's that black box solution that we're so fond of. <laughs> <laughs>